I had a very interesting case come in my office uh, last week, and it begs the question as to whether Lyme disease or oral spiroketosis was the problem. Both patients, a husband and wife, were diagnosed with Lyme disease as well as their daughter. However, the wife showed symptoms and the husband and the daughter did not show any symptoms. The wife had Bell's palsy and fatigue and other symptoms that are related to Lyme disease. However, the husband was uh, perfectly normal as was the daughter. In this case, we found spirochetes in the gingival sulcus, which begs the question of, is this a misdiagnosed case of oral spirochetosis diagnosed as Lyme disease? Or is Lyme disease actually in the gingival sulcus? Are Lyme disease in the gingival sulcus? That really is a good question. We don't know at this point. If they are, then uh, the gingival sulcus is actually a good reservoir for spirochetes in general. And if they are there, then they can recontaminate the rest of the body once uh, treatment has done, been done for Lyme disease. I wonder if oral spirochetosis is misdiagnosed as Lyme disease. Are Lyme disease spirochetes in the gingival sulcus? If so, they are easily diagnosed microscopically there. The gingival sulcus can provide an incubation there for Lyme spirochetes. We know that the gingival sulcus is a great incubator for other bacteria, including oral spirochetes. If the Lyme spirochetes are in a gingival sulcus, could they be passed to other hosts similar to oral spirochetes? Could this explain why Lyme disease is so easily passed to patients but no evidence of tick bites or any uh, exposure to the woods or ticks has been found? Uh, this question has been asked and wondering how patients that don't seem to have any um, exposure or any evidence of a tick bite end up with Lyme disease. Gingival sulcus is an excellent breeder incubator for all spirochetes, as I said before. And if Lyme disease spirochetes are able to get into gingival sulcus, they could multiply there and infect the rest of the body. Oral spirochetes are passed during kissing or passing of saliva. And I wonder, could Lyme be passed as well? It makes sense that they could. I think if you study one spirochete, you study them all. If one spirochete lives in the gingival sulcus, probably they all can live there. And if, that is, if that's the case, then they could be spread the same as oral spirochetes or what we call periodontal disease. Are oral spirochetes misdiagnosed as Lyme disease? This is a distinct possibility. If a patient has oral spirochetes, are they misdiagnosed or cross-contaminated in the, the uh, Western blot test is Lyme. Could treatment for periodontal disease eliminate the symptoms of misdiagnosed Lyme disease? All these beg the question. All these need to be studied. At this point, we just don't know. Now here's the microscopic of the husband. Interesting enough, he had spirochetes throughout his whole mouth. The wife, she didn't. She had, I couldn't find spirochetes until I got to the tooth that she had a problem with. Turned out to be tooth number three. But here, the husband had far more spirochetes with no symptoms than the wife did with a few spirochetes. It's interesting to note that these spirochetes are extremely heavy, heavy duty. They're very thick and uh, they're moving extremely fast. And the uh, screen you also see a lot of fast moving rods these spirochetes are also associated with many different other kind of bacteria especially spinning gliding and unulating rods and in this situation um, he had quite a few other um, bacteria as well but you can see that these spirochetes are moving extremely spinning extremely fast they're very thick these are probably about the thickest spirochetes i've ever seen and i wonder if the fact that they're so thick that they may be more virulent or, or cause disease more than the really fine spirochetes. You can see a little, what I think is a cyst form right above the spirochete there. And we find these mixed in, uh, these fields, along with the spirochetes, as if they always have reserve of the cyst forms in case something happens and uh, the environment kills the spirochete. They always seem to have these spore forms in the background. You also notice that in his case he has the small uh, diameter spirochetes as well. 
Now, I don't know whether small ones are oral spirochetes and the large ones are Lyme disease spirochetes or not. We have no way of knowing at this point. The little black bodies you see floating by, when I was doing stop action photography on those, it's the ones that had the morphology uh, that I showed in my book. Uh, when you stop action them, they actually have, it's a donut, a flat donut shape with a, a light uh, center to it and a, a light halo around it. Now this is the transition to the wife and here you can see the spider type spirochetes or grouping or uh, colony. And so this is um, a very typical uh, configuration that we see in so many cases where spirochetes are clumped together. I don't know what they seem to be grasping in the center but they seem to be uh, holding together in some sort of configuration. In her case, we were only able to find these spirochetes around one uh, root canal treated teeth. And um, this is where on the upper right side, she complained about the Bell's palsy. And I wonder if the spirochetes in that area were able to get into the trigeminal nerve and then affect nerve sensation on that side of her face. I know that this has been reported in the literature that spirochetes actually can get into nerve endings and actually affect nerves. Now also I wonder in her case whether it's the oral spirochetosis is a problem and it's really not Lyme disease but a misdiagnosed case of Lyme disease which is actually oral spirochetosis and she's having her symptoms from spirochetes but not necessarily from the Lyme disease spirochetes. This I think is a very interesting question. I think that we need to solve this problem because as far as I'm concerned oral spirochetosis can produce the same symptoms as Lyme disease. But I think that the diagnosis may be mixed up uh, with the DNA of the different spirochetes and maybe there is cross-contamination in the tests. So this study needs to be done and we need to figure out uh, which spirochetes are in the gingival sulcus and whether Lyme disease actually lives in the gingival sulcus. And if it does, then what are the implications of this? Can we treat Lyme disease as periodontal disease? Um, when we get uh, done treating Lyme disease, are spirochetes protected in the gingival sulcus and thus recontaminating the body? Uh, these questions all need to be answered. Right now, I think um, it's up in the air. And if it's true that Lyme disease or the Borrelia burgdorferi can live in the gingival sulcus, then this is going to open up a whole new world in the Lyme disease research. Because if we don't get rid of them there, we're not going to get rid of them anywhere because uh, through bacteremias and periodontal disease, they'll constantly reaffect the rest of the body. And therefore, you'll never ever get a final treatment of Lyme disease.